Thank you very much, Emiliano, for this uh, fantastic overview of new developments in the uh, systemic treatment of RCC. So we have now a great panel here, and we would like to start a discussion uh, about using these uh, drugs uh, in, in for a second line. And I would like to ask you to participate in this uh, uh, in this discussion um, because you know this is the chance to uh, to ask all the questions. So I would like to give you the first option to, 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 to raise a question here. Who can I give the word? Do I see someone? Okay, we start here with the panel. So my first question is for Camilo. Camilo, you showed us that um, we have actually little but excellent data for sunitinib 2-1 schedule, showing really decreased toxicity and and possibly improved efficacy because people are able to maintain the dose of the treatment. So my question is, are you starting with the 2-1 schedule or are you waiting for toxicities that uh, would um, kind of guide you to, to modify the schedule? Well, I think that the data presented by Sergio and also confirmed by the Canadian group, uh, Christian Kohlmansberger, suggest that uh, the 2-1 schedule of sunitinib is definitely uh, more tolerable. And this is a, a, a fact because at the end of the day we know from very everyday clinical practice that uh, toxicity tends to occur starting from uh, week number three. So it, it makes sense to, to, to give uh, the patient a break then. Um, as far as the activity, the data presented by Sergio are quite interesting. Of course, they are retrospective, so should be handled with care. At the end of the day, my attitude today is to uh, change the schedule as soon as the relevant toxicity appears, not for the, from the very beginning. No questions. I would like to ask a question to Bernard. So, you have shown that, uh, in fact, for most patients, the use of bevacizumab in combination with interferon is a good treatment option. If those patients fail, what would then be your second-line treatment? Is there still room for a TKI, or do you have to switch then to an mTOR inhibitor? I, th I think there is no doubt. I mean, TKI after bevacizumab should be given, and uh, I will not uh, discuss which one we should use in, in second line if, if we use bevacizumab, but uh, I would certainly use uh, a TKI after bevacizumab. It works. I mean, it has been shown with axitinib, it has been shown with sorafenib. It's probably also uh, valid with uh, sunitinib and pazopanib. So I, w I do start with bevacizumab, and when I do that, I, I continue with uh, TKI. Probably now that we have axitinib, I would probably switch to axitinib in second line uh, because that's probably the most potent one I would use at that time. I don't have any data uh, to present here. The second thing we know is that when we use bevacizumab as first line treatment, the number of patients who go to second line is higher than when we use sunitinib in first line. That's what we, we reported in our experience. So I think it's another uh, piece of information which could be uh, interesting, I mean, because we are using selective uh, inhibition and then we can use wider ones. So I, I think that's another agreement. Bernard, uh, are you starting with the low dose interferon or are you starting with 9 million units? No, I think, I, I think I'm very conservative. So the same way I'm, I'm starting with four week on, two week off for sunitinib and switching as Camillo do when we have toxicity now, I, I do start with 9 million and I but I'm very happy to go down to uh, three, million, 3 million very rapidly if we have toxicity. So I have no, no problem now. We, uh, we have the Melichar data to, to go down to 3 million. Can you use the microphone? Bernard is, is always extremely good in defending bevacizumab and an interferon. I'm just wondering, in your practice, is that what you really use as first-line therapy? <laughs> the the, the, the net answer is no. Uh, is no, not, not, not really a lot. And, and I, I, I think th that's, that's a problem for me. I, I, I think we have been uh, pushed by, by drug company, and I think uh, GSK and Pfizer are doing a great job, and I think it's easier to give TKI uh, in practice, and uh, 
patients like mostly to have oral drugs. They don't have to come back to, to the hospital. When I, I prepared this talk and when I look at the evidence we have, honestly, I still think we are not doing the best job we, we should do in terms of clinical oncologists by not using this drug anymore. And I think, I think we are doing mistake. Honestly, that's what I think. But I, I'm not using a lot of bad plus interferon, honestly. So, so just, um, Bernard, can you just add on to that? If it seems like with the other TKIs, there is at least a movement to use them later in the line of therapy despite lack of data. But with bevacizumab, there's actually thoughts that it does not tend to work well in the post-TKI um, setting. So would you ever consider using BEV interferon or single-agent BEV um, in the second, third, fourth line setting after a frontline TKI? So, so I would say uh, I almost never do that, uh, except, I mean, we, we have a program with targeted, uh, targeted therapy where we do biopsy, and if we have a VGF uh, pathway activated, we can use uh, in a few patients bevacizumab alone in third or fourth line. When you look back, I mean, in 2006 and seven, I mean, we all have used bevacizumab in third and fourth line, and we all have observed some activity. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that it has some activity. When we discussed with Roche and Genentech some years ago to do a second line trial or a third line trial, they said never, we just want to be in first line. And in fact, they are never, they are nowhere. So I think, I think it's a pity for kidney cancer because that's a really active drug that we don't use probably anymore anywhere, which is, in my mind, a mistake for the patients. So I have, a, I have another question. Um, I'm working in Italy where we uh, have an uh, agency, IFA, the, the agency of Pharmaco, which can tell us what we can and can't do. And the way Oxitinib has been approved has been approved based on the, the pivotal study, and we can only give Oxitinib if the patients have had sunitinib. So what about our patients with... Um, who have had Pitsopinib. Do you think this is correct, that we shouldn't be able to give Exitim after Pitsopinib? Do you think we should write to the authorities? Do you think we need another study? Are you uh, answering the question, Robert? I'll try. I mean, I, I think there clearly is activity of Exitim after Pitsopinib. We've certainly used it quite extensively, um, but I would accept that there is no firm trial data and Ideally, there probably sh should be, or at least, a, an extensive retrospective analysis. I, w I would, I would go to this question. I think uh, you, uh, Cora, Camillo, Sergio, are good enough to go and see the, the Italian authority and say, "Don't be stupid." I mean, these two drugs are really equivalent. So. Uh, don't let, I mean, uh, go to the ESMO guidelines, go to NCCN guidelines. I mean, Axitim is approved after TKI. It's not because EME has given only post-sunitinib because the trial was done only after sunitinib that we should not use it after TKI in general. So you have, you have to do lobbying and go to Italian authority. Optimistic. Emiliano. Yes, I have a question for Dr. Hawkins and Scudier which is uh, in the context of a patient that is receiving pasopanib or bevacizumab first-line therapy without toxicity and with good efficacy, how do you make a decision on when to stop treatment? I mean, I have heard Bernard, for example, saying that he stopped treatment with the patients on bevacizumab, for example. How do you decide when to stop for a patient that is getting uh, antitumor activity and perfect tolerance or almost perfect tolerance? So I, I don't know about, about pazopanib, and, uh, and Bob is going to, to answer this question. About, about bevacizumab, when we used it a lot, and uh, we used it a lot uh, for a certain period of time, in the other end trial, we used to stop at one year. We used to stop interferon, and because of the double-blind uh, fashion, I mean, many people, including myself, stop at one year bevacizumab, and we had very good results. So I think it certainly makes sense, af at least after one year, uh, if you have a good stable disease or a partial response to stop, and, and we had the surprise, I mean, to have some patients with very long stable disease or partial response after stopping the drug. We also have, I mean, some data with, uh, with TKI about uh, cessation, and we have uh, put with Brian Rennie team, I mean, uh, our updated uh, uh, study uh, that will be presented at, at ASCO, and I think some patients will also benefit from cessation. I would say somewhere around one year. 
So, so clearly the data would suggest, Bernard, that patients, the majority of patients are going to progress six months to nine months after stopping therapy, whether you're on TKI or BEV. And so can you, do you re-challenge them? Do you put them back on the BEV interferon at that point, or do you move on to another therapy? So I, 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 for, for this patient, I mean, I did put them back to, to bevacizumab and interferon. It, it, it worked in, in many patients. Uh, of course, I have more experience with TKI with this kind of uh, interruption, but with BEV, it, it also works. I suppose with, with pisoponib or, or with sunitinib, for that matter, if the patient is, is tolerating treatment well and continuing to respond, we, we would generally carry on. If there is any suggestion of toxicity, we'd have a low threshold for having a, a treatment break and going back on treatment. And generally, we've, we've seen patients respond again when they were responding uh, after, after stopping. And I mean, I think there is, there is a trial in the UK going on, the, the STAR study, which will formally answer whether that's a good strategy or, or not. But uh, it, it seems a reasonable one in the absence of data. I would like to, to ask a question to Tom. So, uh, I mean, you presented very nice data about mTOR inhibitor. So, in first line, I, I agree with you that TEM has the most evidence uh, phase free data. Uh, but in your own practice, how are you selecting those patients where you give TEM and those patients where you give sunitinib or TKI? What, what do you do in your own practice? I, I use the Escudier patented eyeball test. No, so, so you know when the person walks in the door with poor risk disease without having to actually calculate factors. So patients who are really um, potentially hospice candidates, but they're newly diagnosed, um, very, you know, they usually will have hypercalcemia, malignancy, and other of the poor risk features. And, and that patient, my experience has been that, that for some reason, the TOR inhibition um, doesn't necessarily cause a lot of tumor shrinkage. I've never been impressed with it being a, a drug that causes um, response that way, but it seems to do something to the biology of the cancer. It shuts off the biologic activity of the cancer to a point that the patients actually start feeling better for a period of time um, before they ultimately succumb to the disease. And, and so um, in that unique patient population, which is a minority, and I'm a tertiary quaternary referral center, it's a minority of my practice, I will use it then. Now I'll consider the VEGF inhibitors because there are some thoughts that maybe they have some activity in poor risk disease and maybe someone that isn't as poor risk um, by the eyeball test or more functional, we think, I think they can handle the toxicity concerns. But if it's a true poor risk person, then um, I will use TEM. Other questions from the audience? No? I so I, I want to ask a, a question to Emiliano. So you, you raised the point about cabozantinib and the dose which is used in the, in the phase three, that it's, it's certainly a good point. We had the same question about temsirolimus when we compare the dose we use in kidney cancer compared to what we use in mental cell cancer, for example. So do you think uh, with cabozantinib there, there is a real uh, plateau in activity would justify to go at 60, which is actually an accepted tolerated dose, or do you think we are doing a, a very big mistake by using 60? I, I, I appreciate the question because actually so I am right. astonished by the data that, uh, I mean, by the design of the, of the two randomized trials with cabosantinib. I mean, it is like 40% of the recommended dose found in the phase one trials. It is 40% of the dose that is recommended for uh, uh, medullary cancer of the thyroid. And we already know what can happen here. We had the experience with jefitinib uh, uh, in lung cancer, which is also given a 40% of the dose. We have the experience with temsirolimus. Temsirolimus, it is given a 30-40% of the recommended dose. And as uh, Thomas was saying, from a pharmacokinetically point of view, and also from a pharmacodynamic uh, point of view, it is demonstrated that tensirolimus is unable to inhibit the pathway as well as it is done with everolimus because of the different dose. So I am really concerned that if the uh, meteor study comes negative, if it is a demonstration of lack of enough activity of the drug or because of just uh, not enough drug in the patient, you know? So, so let me just add to this, because this is a very interesting point, and, and many of you in the room may be uh, GU doctors who treat prostate cancer, and so cabozantinib is being evaluated in prostate cancer and in other tumor types, and every tumor type outside of thyroid cancer is at the 60 milligram dose. 
So I've, I've inquired about this too. Clearly, we have seen the phenomenon that, that some cancer types, the patients with those cancers tolerate different levels of a drug. And it's a phenomenon that I don't fully understand. And if anyone in the room has an idea why the thyroid patients seem to tolerate the higher dose, whenever I've used it off-label, because it is approved in the, the US, so I can give Cometric, which is the brand name, cabozantinib, um, and I can um, prescribe it to them. Whenever people have started at the full dose with the thyroid, they have kidney cancer, they have a lot of side effects, and then we lower them down to 60 milligrams. And then my anecdotal experience in prostate cancer and in kidney cancer is that we see profound levels of activity of the drug. Now, whether that's a bias, because it's just my experience, but um, the drug seems to have activity even at the 60 milligram dose, and it's certainly much more, much more tolerated. There's a question over here, please. Yes. Actually, I don't have the answer to this question, but I have another question. So, um, regarding the use of Everolimus first line in poor risk patients, so um, besides the, um, the registration and trials, trials we have, is there any strong argument against the use of Everolimus in first line in poor risk patients because um, these patients wouldn't have to come to the hospital once a week. They could stay at home with their families. And um, based on the da data we saw this uh, morning, um, at least um, the substance should be as active as Temsorolimus. I mean, that's what we would, th we would think that. I mean, there's different people that have different opinions whether the drugs are exactly equivalent or is, is Temsorolimus a weaker drug because of the bolus administration of it. Um, my experience has been that Temsorolimus, outside of the inconvenience of the patient coming in weekly, seems to be more tolerated than the, the Everolimus at home. Certainly our breast cancer docs that use Affinitor have issues, you know, they've gone through this whole idea of, of the side effects and management of them more so than, than we have in kidney cancer. Um, Bernard was just mentioning to me that he has a trial looking at that. Yeah, we, we have an ongoing trial in France with uh, Affinitor in, in first line in Boris patients. and. Uh, um, the only thing I can tell you, don't use it until we have the data from this trial. I think that's important. We can't say that they're the same. We really need that data. I, I just wanted to go back to the cabozantinib. I participated in the Comet prostate cancer trial where the dose was 60 milligrams, and I can tell you that in every one of my patients I had to lower the dose to 40 milligrams because perhaps the prostate cancer patients are sicker, they've been on ADT, they've had chemo, they've had out of burrito or enzalutamide, and we thought that that was the problem. And um, with uh, the kidney cancer patients, I would really be frightened to, to start at any other dose after the experience in prostate cancer, and I think that, that it's, it's probably enough to start in 60. It's really probably enough. Yeah, the thing is that uh, prostate cancer patients are really much more fragile. I mean, exactly. they don't tolerate sunitinib the same dose, uh, taxotere, and also with cabosantinib. But if you go to the recommended dose in the phase one trial by Dr. Chiyuri, it is for kidney cancer patients. And the recommended dose is 140. So it is the same population. But I do not believe that our kidney cancer patients would tolerate that dose. Not from my experience, anyway. The data are there. I mean, they have not a high percentage of grade three toxicity, whatever. I mean, at least in that uh, phase one trial. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should end here. Uh, I would like to, to, to thank all the speakers for the excellent presentations. I would like to thank you for being here and asking the questions. Um, and see you next time. <laughs>